In 1971, Don McLean recorded a song called Vincent. It was a defense of the sanity of Dutch painter Vincent van Gogh, or van Koch, or van Ho, or van Gogh, depending on where you're from and how far you want to deviate from the authentic American pronunciation. According to McLean, Van Gogh wasn't crazy, as most people think of crazy. He had some sort of mental illness that allowed him to see the world differently. But what Van Gogh saw wasn't wrong. He was seeing things that others couldn't see. And he tried to share his perspective through his paintings, but people didn't understand. In his short life, Van Gogh produced more than 2,000 paintings and drawings, but he only sold one of them. The world just wasn't interested in Van Gogh's works until after his death. He's now one of history's most famous painters, but McLean thinks that people are still missing the point. He talks to Van Gogh in his song and says, Colors changing hue, morning fields of amber grain, weathered faces lined in pain, are soothed beneath the artist's loving hand. Now I understand what you tried to say to me, and how you suffered for your sanity and how you tried to set them free. They would not listen. They did not know how. Perhaps they'll listen now. For years, I thought that McLean's song was a bunch of sentimental nonsense, mainly because Van Gogh was obviously insane. He chopped off his own ear and delivered it to a girl in a brothel. He experienced hallucinations. He was institutionalized. He ultimately committed suicide in a field. What sense does it make to say that he was suffering for his sanity? He was suffering from insanity. But some recent discoveries have forced me to rethink my view of Van Gogh, primarily discoveries about the ear incident. For decades, it's been suggested that Van Gogh didn't really cut off his ear. He only cut off a small piece of his ear, just the lobe. But researchers located drawings by a doctor who treated him, and he did cut off most of his ear. Part of the lobe was all that was left. There were also doubts about whether Van Gogh was the one who did the cutting. His friend Paul Gauguin, another artist, was proficient with the sword, and he and Van Gogh had gotten into a heated argument. Some have argued that Gauguin cut off Van Gogh's ear when Van Gogh charged him in a fit of rage. Van Gogh claimed that he remembered nothing about losing his ear, so there's precious little to go on. The key to solving the mystery of Van Gogh's ear may lie in the identity of the recipient. We've always known that Van Gogh wrapped his ear in newspaper and delivered it to a girl named Rachel at a local brothel. He handed it to her and said, guard this object carefully. Without knowing anything about Rachel, it was quite natural to suppose that she was a prostitute, that Van Gogh was in love with her, and that giving her his ear was the incredibly creepy love offering of a deranged and obsessed stalker. Fortunately, thanks to Bernadette Murphy, a researcher who sifted through documents to figure out who this Rachel was, we now know that she wasn't a prostitute. Her real name was Gabrielle. Rachel was a nickname. She was a 19-year-old farmer's daughter who worked as a maid in the brothel. She was working as a maid to pay off her medical debts. She had medical debts because she had been mauled by a rabid dog. Doctors had to cauterize her wounds with a hot iron to keep her from bleeding to death. Then they spent weeks treating her for rabies. So here's a girl with scars from the rabid dog and burns from the cauterization cleaning brothels. People stare at her because she's disfigured. And Vincent van Gogh, the awkward painter who lives in the yellow house, chops off his ear and brings it to her. This is not, hey, I love you, let me chop off my ear and give it to you as a present. This is, hey, I see people staring at you. I'll give them something else to stare at. You're disfigured. Now I'm going to be disfigured with you. This isn't the act of a deranged stalker. This is an act of excessive compassion by a mentally unstable man. Van Gogh was extraordinarily sensitive to the suffering of other people. He was the opposite of me, which is why I find him fascinating. Too much empathy or too little empathy, either one drives you mad. But he was in no position to help this girl. He was broke. He couldn't pay her debts. He couldn't take away her scars. So he did the only thing he could. He suffered with her. I don't know if she got the message. Rachel trying to understand Van Gogh severing his ear may have paralleled people trying to understand his paintings. They would not listen. 
they did not know how. I should point out that there are non-crazy versions of what Van Gogh did. You can be perfectly sane and try to understand what someone is going through and try to enter into this person's suffering in order to help. My son Reed has a genetic muscle disease called myotubular myopathy. His muscles are extremely weak, too weak to walk or eat or breathe. So machines do a lot of the work. A machine pumps air through a tube in Reed's throat. It's called a trach tube. A few years ago, Reed started pulling the tube out, and that can lead to problems because it isn't always easy to get back in. So we would strap the trach tube to his neck, but he would manage to get the straps off and pull it out. He would pull out the tube that he breathes through, and he would hide it. We were trying to figure out if it was irritating him, was it itchy, was he just trying to get attention? We didn't know. But one day, my wife said, I think Reed is realizing that he's different from the rest of us. Maybe he's pulling out his tube because he wants to be normal. Then my oldest son, Luke, proposed a solution. He said, I don't want Reed to feel like he's different, so I think we should cut the inside tubes off of some old trachs and tie the trachs to our necks and wear them when we're around Reed so he'll think that it's normal. Proud father moment. Luke wanted to help Reed by becoming more like Reed, just as Van Gogh apparently wanted to help Rachel by becoming more like Rachel. The difference was that Luke's idea wasn't crazy. A crazy Van Gogh-ish version would have been actually getting a tracheotomy, the surgery that puts a hole in your neck, to be more like his brother. But why would it be crazy to chop off your ear to share the suffering of a disfigured girl, or to cut a hole in your neck to share the suffering of a disabled brother? Well, by nature, self-preservation is very high on our list of priorities. Our biological systems are geared towards it, and that's a good thing. It helps us survive. You can go against your self-preservation instinct in certain situations if something is important enough to you. A soldier can throw himself on a grenade to save his friends. A firefighter can run into a burning building to rescue people. But we wouldn't deliberately cause massive injuries to our bodies just to show compassion towards other people. Something in your head is dangerously out of balance if self-preservation goes out the window when you see someone suffering. And that's why we would say that Van Gogh was insane, at least at certain times. Notice, however, that it would be odd to fault someone for being too deeply affected by other people's suffering. We wouldn't say, you care too much, what a dirtbag. It's good to be concerned about a girl's suffering. It's good to want to help. It's not Van Gogh being hyper-compassionate that troubles us. It's Van Gogh being periodically so unconcerned for his own safety that his compassion could completely overwhelm him and he would start chopping off parts of his own body. That's when we say that something has gone horribly wrong. There are two events in history that were such radical examples of someone laying aside his own status for the good of others, that much of the world's population regards the events as utterly ridiculous or downright insane. The most disturbing part is that these events are put forward as the foundation of Christian ethics. In Philippians 2, the Apostle Paul says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. What Paul says about Christ here, by the way, is an early Christian song. It's called the Carmen Christi, the hymn to Christ. If you'd like to know what the first generation of Christians sang during their worship, they sang this. They sang about Christ being in the form of God, being in very nature God, but not considering that equality with the Father, that glorified status, something he had to cling to. Instead, he lowered himself by taking on human nature, the nature of a servant. As a man, he humbled himself even further and was crucified. So the two instances of Christ laying aside his own status for the good of others are the Incarnation, Christ entering our world, and the Crucifixion, Christ facing not only the worst punishment the Roman Empire could come up with, but also the Father's wrath against our 
rebellion. And if you're not a Christian, both of those probably sound crazy. But they sound crazy to different people for different reasons. Muslims, for instance, find the idea of God entering creation to die for sins ridiculous because they have no concept of a God who would love them enough to do that sort of thing. Allah just isn't very loving, according to the Quran. Allah does not love those who exceed the limits. Allah does not love any ungrateful sinner. Allah does not love the unbelievers. Allah does not love the unjust. Allah does not love him who is proud. Obviously, if God doesn't love people very much, he isn't going to take the astonishing steps of entering creation and dying for their sins. The Christian God is too loving for Muslims to take seriously. At the other end of the spectrum, we have atheists of various kinds who don't say that the Christian God is too loving. They say that he isn't loving enough. If God really loved us, he would solve all of our problems. He would heal Rachel's scars and Van Gogh's ear and Reed's muscles. He would give everyone good health and plenty of food and plenty of money. He would maximize our pleasure and minimize our pain. But he doesn't. So he can't be that loving. And you can see why this objection would apply to God, but not to others. Van Gogh chopped off his ear to suffer with Rachel because he was in no position to heal her wounds. If he could have healed her, he would have just healed her. Likewise, Luke comes up with the idea of wearing trachs when we're around Reed because he's in no position to heal Reed. If he could heal his brother, I'm sure he would heal him. But when we're talking about an omnipotent being, why would he suffer with us when he could just stop the suffering? Interestingly, when Jesus began his public ministry, he did what people wanted him to do. He cured the lepers and gave sight to the blind and fed the hungry and raised the dead. But over and over again, as soon as he said something that people didn't like, the crowds would turn on him, no matter how many people he fed or healed. It seems that their real problem with God went far beyond God not doing enough for them. Jesus even told his closest followers that they would soon abandon him. But as he was telling them that they would betray him, he offered them something. He said, A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Three key claims here. One, in this world, you will have trouble. Jesus doesn't say that he's getting us out of trouble. Two, in me, you may have peace. We still have trouble, but we have peace. Three, I have overcome the world. Jesus overcame the world. Here again, many people wonder, well, if he overcame the world, why doesn't he give us everything we want? But if we're thoroughly embedded in the world, if we're part of this world's way of living and acting and thinking, making our dreams come true isn't overcoming the world, it's surrendering to the world. Jesus was focused on a different problem entirely. After telling his followers that he had overcome the world, Jesus spoke to the Father, and he said, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known, in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. Jesus, who was eternally one with the Father, took on the nature of a servant, and just hours before his crucifixion, prayed to the Father that the Father's love for him would be in us. But how's that possible? The Son is divine and perfect. The Father's love for him is perfect. We're fallen and selfish and greedy. We've been mauled, but not by a dog. We've been seared, but not by a hot piece of iron. We're on life support, and we're pulling out our own breathing tubes. How can the Father's love for the Son be in us? And the answer to that question is called the gospel, the good news. 
we're not good enough, we're not righteous enough to have the Father's love in us. The gospel is the proclamation that God now gives us the righteousness of Christ because of what Christ did on the cross. As the prophet Isaiah said seven centuries before Christ walked the earth, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Because we have the righteousness of Christ, we can have the Father's love for the Son in us. As odd as all of this might sound to you, the early Christians absorbed this message. And once they became convinced that the Lord of creation loved them enough to enter creation and die for them, they found that they had peace, even in the midst of troubles. You could persecute them. They would rejoice. You could torture them. They would walk away praising God. You could feed them to lions. They would die singing songs about Christ. Experiencing the love of God caused them to see the world differently. They tried to share what they saw, but many people couldn't understand the view from the cross. As Jesus suffered on the cross, mocked by the crowds, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Very similar to Don McLean's words nearly 2,000 years later, they would not listen, they did not know how. Perhaps we'll listen now. 